I'm Rich Cole. I'm here in our shop in Naples, Florida at Cole Gunsmithing, and I want to talk a little bit about the uh, DT-11. Um, a number of people have asked us to, to do a video on sort of the DT-11 from a technical standpoint, and so I'm going to do that. Um, we're choosing this particular time because we've just received um, sub-gauge barrels for the DT-11 in 20 gauge and in 28 gauge. So now we've got the ability to, uh, to fit companion barrels to the DT-11 uh, 12 gauge gun. And they can also be retrofit to the, to the uh, uh, DT-10 and the ASEs with some limitations. We'll get there later in the video. Um, we've worked with Beretta for several years now to, to try and um, get them to correctly design and produce these sub-gauge barrels um, that are available in 32 inch and in 30 inch as companion barrels. And of course it's a, it's a really big project because in order to get the weights right so that the balance feels correct is, is very, very challenging when you change from 12 bore to 20 and then to, to 28. Uh, the reason that we don't do 410, because that's going to be the question that I get asked, is, is that it really is just not simply possible to build a 410 um, at the correct weight and, and weight distribution in the barrel uh, for a serious competition gun like the, like the DT-11. Um, we know that the history of the DT-11 obviously has followed the DT-10, which followed the ASE series. Uh, the gun uses the locking, the cross bolt type locking system uh, that was pioneered by Beretta back in the very late 1920s and is still in use in the, the Custom Shop SO series today. Um, we know that the DT-11 has been particularly successful you know, in international competition. Um, there have been scores of, of top competitors you know, shoot this gun uh, along with some of the other popular brands. Uh, most recently, uh, Zach Keinbaum has won the U.S. National Sporting Clays Championships three times. Uh, many of the Beretta team members, uh, Anthony Matteris, uh, has had a lot of success with the, with the DT-11 as well. Uh, so I'm just going to show you quickly uh, some of the different variations of the DTs. Um, as you can see, you know, on the top there's a DT-11 double E double L with the engraved side plates. This is a sporting clays gun. And then down we go with the, the Lusso model. Um, this is an anniversary model. This is the DT-11 black with the carbon fiber rib and the carbon fiber trigger plate. Um, recently, um, our partners in Italy, TSK, have introduced a raised rib, um, which will retrofit instead of the carbon fiber rib to give a, a, a mid rib type of a, of, a, of a sight picture. And uh, we'll give more information on that with some TSK stuff in a, in a different video. Um, the standard DT-11 is here on the bottom, the, the silver with the, with the blue line. And then of course, we've got lots of them, you know, going across the, the rack here. Here's some uh, upgrade blanks. Um, I always get pretty excited about when I get to, when I get to show these when you get blanks that are you know that that are really exceptional in quality because with the DT11s you know we we are able to restock them to to customers dimensions uh, basically we can sell the gun and include the custom stock job so the person doesn't have to buy the gun and then wonder what they're going to do with their original wood set when they get it when they get it restocked um, following a little bit further over here you know up on top you've got the ACS models as well there so moving moving back over here I'm going to show you these barrels um, and then we're going to take a break and we're going to show you how to disassemble a DT-11 and basically all of the in innards and, and, and how it works and we're going to show you how to actually properly fit a barrel to a, a DT-10 slash DT-11. But uh, for example, this is, this is uh, a 28 gauge, 32 inch barrel. Um, again, it's built on a 12 gauge monoblock. Um, the, the fore end hanger is spaced such that the 12 gauge fore end will couple properly because they've got a spacing pad here and then the wooden side panels. Um, if you do a close up on this, you can see that there's some protective tape that we haven't removed. So. You know, that's, that's not a defect in finishing, that's just a protective tape that the factory applies so that during the handling of the, of the barrels, uh, they don't get scuffed up as much. Uh, then again, we also have a 20 gauge. This is a 20 gauge, so you can see that basically they're identical. And 
The barrel weights here that we see is on the 20 gauge we have 1,520 grams and we have 1,510 grams you know, on the 28 gauge. And these weights will vary a little bit anywhere from around 1,510 is about the lightest. We've seen some 12 bore 32 inch barrels um, up as heavy as 1580. The majority of them are 1520, 30, 40, 50. That's, that's the range. So basically Beretta is managing to keep um, these barrels within about an ounce of the 12 bore barrels, which is, which is just about miraculous when you consider what the challenge is to make small gauge the same as the, as the full 12 bore. So we're gonna take a break. I'm gonna put my shop apron on and we're gonna go to work. Okay, so now we're back here in the, in the gunsmithing area, and uh, I'm gonna start right from scratch and take this gun apart for you. Um, this one happens to be a DT11 EELL model, so it's got the uh, ornamental side plates. Um, other than that, mechanically speaking, it's the same thing. You notice that I've got my shop apron on, so I'm gonna throw it out there. I've had lots of people ask me, Rich, where do you get your shop apron? And I do not buy shop aprons made overseas. We keep it here in the USA and the company that we get these shop aprons from, they actually custom make them to order and it's called Tec Texas Heritage Woodworks and they're in Menard, Texas and they're wonderful people to deal with and uh, I'm getting ready to buy all my gunsmiths custom made aprons from these people. Don't tell anybody because they don't know that yet. So here we are. I've got a six millimeter stock wrench. We're gonna put it in and we're gonna take the stock off, take it off. I note that this gun came in, the stock is loose, okay? So one of the points to the shooters is make sure your stocks take, stay tight. If the stock bolt loosens up a little bit, the stock can work on the action and the next thing you know, you get a crack. So for all brands, just the word to the wise is, be aware that the stock needs to stay tight on the action. So now we're gonna take the stock off, set it aside, and that was fairly easy. I'm gonna take a dead blow hammer, okay, which is non-marring. I'm gonna tap and pull, and I'm gonna pull these side plates off, just like so, okay? So there's, there's the, uh, the DT11 EELL action. Um, Obviously, we can see the cutaway here. We've got a little corrosion, we'll, we'll clean that up. Um, you can see what's all going on in here. It looks pretty complex. It actually isn't once you understand how it works. Um, one of the other things we get a lot of questions on is, how do I take the trigger assembly out of my DT10, DT11, okay? It's fairly simple, but there's a sequence, okay? So, with the top lever closed, okay, I'm gonna push the safety to the safe position. Now, knowing that I'm in the safe position, I'm gonna to push to fire, and then I'm gonna push really hard, and it goes about a half of a click, and you hear it. Then I'm gonna push the top lever all the way until it locks. Notice that I pushed it all the way in one fell swoop. I didn't start and then release it and let it go. You gotta push it all in one swoop, and then the trigger assembly will just simply hinge right out the back. It, it tips out the back. There's a little lip on the front edge here. You can see that little lip when you go to put it back in again, that little lip goes in the front and then it tips itself back up in. Then when I release the top lever, it's gonna lock itself in there. And uh, I'm gonna do that one more time and have the photographer come over here and, and do a close up so you can see what's happening on the inside of the gun when I do that. When I push the safety forward, okay, it's gonna toggle that little bar up behind a notch in the top lever cam so that when we open the top lever, it pushes this whole spring-loaded block back. And you can see the teeth right there. So now the assembly hinges out, okay? I'm gonna set the trigger assembly aside. Um, I'm not gonna disassemble that for you in this video. This video is gonna be way too long and too involved. Um, anyone that's interested in information about the, the DT trigger system, um, they can refer to the video that we did. We did a fairly in-depth video on converting the DT trigger to a mechanical trigger for 410 use. And if you go on our channel and look at that, you'll be able to see more about the trigger. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna release the, the top lever and take the, take the spring tension off here. I'm gonna take my homemade bench block and I'm gonna 
take the pin out that retains the block that the stock bolt goes into. Okay. So we're going to take that out. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the pin out up here that retains the, the assembly which retains the trigger. The starter and push that through. Okay. Now we can jiggle everything out. It all falls out. You take your magic hammer and reassemble in reverse order. Okay. okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the firing pins out to get them out of the way. Then we're going to take the top lever cam out, remove the top lever and the lock and bolt so that we can get into that part of the gun. The, the firing pins come out very, very simply. Uh, they each have a retaining pin. We're just going to tap this through. I'm going to reach around with my fingers and grab it on the other side. Okay. Now that's the lower firing pin is loose. The firing pins are directional. Whoops. The lower one is the right and the upper one is the left. They both have springs. The, the, the left or the upper firing pin is the longer one of the two. Now, notice close up here, look at the crud on those firing pins. Okay, this gun has been piercing primers. I don't think you can see it in this, in this video. I don't think you can get close up enough, but even with my aging eyes, I can see the cratering on the nose of both of these firing pins. So we're going to replace those. Okay, but with some of the ammo today, the primers pierce. Well, we've got all kinds of ammo problems today. And you know, some of the some of the off-brand ammo where they're trying to keep the costs down. Obviously the, the components are not of the same level of quality as premium grade and the primers will pierce when the firing pin strikes them and it causes a little bit of a gas cutting on the nose of the, of the firing pin. And that causes a lot of problems. I mean if you notice that you're piercing primers, stop with that ammo, um, change ammo, see what happens, but don't just continue because you're damaging your gun if you do that. So now I've got a little spring hook, it's kind of like a crochet hook, and I'm going to reach in and I'm going to pull the firing pins out, firing pin springs out, get them out of the way. Okay. Now what's left okay, are the cocking cams and the cocking cam springs, and there, there's, there's no need for me to, to, to take them apart for, for what we're doing, but this is the right cocking cam. You can see the little torsion spring in here, can you get that Trask? little torsion spring right there. That's the, that, that is the return spring for the right cocking cam. The cocking cams are the parts that cock the hammers when you open the gun. In front of that is the cocking rod, which is this, which is this round rod. The round rod. So if I take and I push this rod, see how that cam moves? And that's what lifts the hammer back and cocks the hammer. If one of the cocking cam springs is broken, the gun will experience light hit misfires on occasion from that barrel. Okay, Note that the cocking cam springs are dedicated right and left. It's the way that the spring is wound. So if for whatever you, you, you need, you choose to replace those parts, make sure you understand there's a right spring and there's a left spring. Okay. So now we're going we're gonna to turn it upside down here and we're going to use a Torx wrench. Um, I think this is a T15. Yeah, T15. And we're going to take the screw out that retains the top lever. So now we're going to take the locking system apart. We're going to remove the screw that retains the top lever cam into the top lever. That'll allow us to pull the top lever out, remove the locking bolt, the locking bolt lock and spring. There are two, two types of systems in the DTs. Um, the earlier system was a slotted screw on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an engraved fitted head, I mean a slotted nut on, a, on an engraved screw. 
um, and now there are they are T15 Torx, so it's, it's two, two different things. This is a newer one, so it's a Torx screw. You can see I'm taking that out. It's a flat head that locks on a taper. Okay, there's, there's the screw right there, okay. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a brass, a brass screwdriver that I use here, and I'm just gonna tap this a little bit to start lifting it, okay. I'm gonna retain this spring, Look in there really good, because if you don't retain that spring, that plunger, you're going to lose it, and you'll do the gunsmith crawl. Okay, like this. Short version of the gunsmith crawl. Okay, so now we're going to take out the, the top lever spring and plunger. Okay, we've got the cam out. Okay, now we'll roll her over here, and you can see I'm going to hold on to the top lever lock plunger with my thumb, because I don't want I don't want to lose that. I'm going to pull the top lever. I'm going to lift the tail up and kind of pull it out, wiggle it out. And I'm going to roll it over on its side and tap it, all the while holding onto this so we don't so we don't lose that. And I'm going to pull the pull the locking bolt out and then release the top lever lock. Okay, now the top lever lock basically engages the locking bolt like this, and then when the barrels close, it allows this to, 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 to close by. So this is the locking bolt, and this, this bolt is basically the same as it has been now for almost 100 years. And on the bolts, they are coded, okay? There are two angles of the locking surfaces. Um, I, th I think up until 2021, early 2021, they used a 10 degree angle on the bites. Now they use an eight degree angle on the bites. Um, the bolts that are eight degrees are actually marked as eight, and then they also have a coating for size. And on the new series, it's the smallest is A, that's what the gun starts with. There's B, C, and D, with D being the largest. In the earlier 10 degree angles, <coughs> the coating went A, C, B, D. You go figure. So we're working with that with a with a, a fairly recent gun, and so it's got an, it's got an eight degree bolt. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to clean this out. I'm going to clean all the parts up. Okay, and then I'm going to put it back together to the degree that I need to be able to start fitting the barrel. Okay, okay, so now we're ready to start fitting the barrels. If you want to spin around over here, um, Brandon has taken the, the wooden side panels off of the, the barrels for me. I'm going to take the, ex the extractors out to do that. You push them in and then rotate the top towards the center of the, of the axis. In a 12 gauge gun, okay, um, a friend of mine, uh, Steve Edwards, up in New York, builds this EST tool. And basically what this does for guns that don't have to rotate out, if they just use a disc, this tool will save your fingers a lot for working on 12 bore guns. So I'm going to take the lower ejector out, push it in, rotate it out. Now I've got the barrels completely stripped out. So at this point, what we've got to do is we've got to identify the working parts of the barrel, okay? And that is we're going to start with, with the hinge down here, this, this recess right here, that half moon hinge is what the barrel pivots on when it rotates on the pin, on the pin here. So it's going to rotate on that and, and the barrel then, the breech is going to close against the breech face and then we have to take into consideration what, what, what are the recoil shoulders, okay? So what I'm going to do is the first thing to do is to we know that these uh, hinges in the recesses are very, very precisely machined in nine millimeter diameter. Okay, so I'm not going to worry with those yet. I'm going to put, I'm going to put my barrel on the receiver, very, very carefully. You notice it was very, very tight. So I, I worked it on there. I don't want to score the sides of it up. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to close it. We're going to close it up there. Take my dead blow hammer, give the barrel several whacks while I'm lifting up on the on the receiver and that's gonna that's gonna give us a mark okay okay 
and you can see there, there's a mark right there, okay? So what, what our object is, is that we want to see a mark all the way across the top so that we have an even spread of the tension. Um, because if you only have a little mark like this, what's going to happen is eventually the metal's going to move a little bit and the barrel will set further down into the receiver and then, and then the gun gets loose. Okay, so we're going to stop the video right here, do a little bit of work and then come back. Okay, so we got a decent marking to start with, but this set of barrels, as you saw, I was struggling to get it on the receiver. It's just a little bit too wide here. So basically what we're doing is we're taking a little bit of material very carefully off, off the, the sides here. And when I talk about a little material, you know, we may take a thousandth a side off. Um, and then we're going to have to come back and, you know, and rejewel this. Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, you know, in terms of the, the, the width. I'd rather have to fit it than have it be too loose because being nice and snug from side to side in the, in the receiver is going to equate to a better supported barrel um, and that's going to equate into a longer time that the, the gun's going to stay tight on its locking bolts that we fit to. Um, and this, this gun, I went back and I checked the locking bolt and the A locking bolt uh, still fits well to the 12 gauge barrel. So that's the best of all worlds because we're able to not have to go to an oversized lock and bolt yet because we'd rather not fit a brand new set of barrels with an oversized lock and bolt because that's taking a little bit of life out of it. So now you can see how nicely that went in. It's opening and closing nicely. Now what we have to what we have to look at, we've got a couple other surfaces here that we've got to, that we've got to take into consideration. We can't contact here, okay? We can't contact between the bottom of this uh, recoil shoulder and the receiver. And what we're supposed to have when we're all said and done is about uh, two tenths of a millimeter of clearance between the recoil shoulder and the receiver. So there's some fitting work done there as well. So I'm making some adjustment here. We're taking, as I said, just a little bit off polishing it a little bit more. I want to create a really nice fit in there. And this is just one of those things where you, you kind of have to sneak up on it a little bit at a time. If you, if you zoom in over here, you can see the marking down around above where the, where the hinge recess is there. You can see that marking. That's where it's touching. So we're going to work on that particular area and clean that up right there. Take a little bit of the tension off of that. There we go. That's a, that's a nice fit now. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the locking bolt in and, 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 and work on the, the bites just a little bit. So now we're going we're gonna to put this back together again to get the lock and bolt in there. The top lever lock, the lock and bolt, the top lever. Okay. Now we're going to put the spring in and get the cam in. This is, this is the fun part right here. Okay, so I have a special tool that I've made and this tool allows me to torque the cam um, in order to, 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 to get it to go back together again. Pretty difficult to do if you don't have this tool, okay. Um, this tool goes down in here, okay, I'm going to use a screwdriver very carefully. I'm going to apply pressure and compress that spring and then drop the, 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 cam in, the cam into place, okay? So I've done that three or four times before. There we go. Maybe five or six times over the last 42, 43 years, yeah. So I'm not torquing everything down at this point. I've not got it lubed up because I'm probably gonna end up taking it apart again. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and see how the, the locking bolt engages the, the bites of the, of the receiver. So you'll notice 
these two extensions, these barrel extensions, the, we also call them bites. On the new guns, okay, they've got an eight degree angle here and I think like one and a half or something backwards. Uh, I'm not sure on, on that angle. Don't have that in my head this morning. But I'm putting some, some uh, uh, Dicom blue on. It's not Dicom blue, it's, we, it's called uh, high spot blue. It doesn't dry, it's just a, a very intense blue oil-based transfer medium, okay? There we go. So, as I close, you can see that it's, it's closing very, very nicely, all right? Uh, I'm gonna give the bolt a little bit of a tap, open it up, and now I'm gonna look at it here, and I don't think you can see it in the camera, but what I'm paying very, very close attention to is where the locking bolt has rubbed your barrel extensions, okay? That's very, very critical. Anytime people have problems in the locking systems of these guns, okay, um, it generally has to do with the angles on the locking bolt not being correct in terms of the way that they bear on the angle of the barrel extensions. And so this is very, very critical. Um, I'm not doing this video to encourage people to buy barrels and try and fit them at home. We're just doing it from an educational standpoint so people understand because <clears throat> so often <clears throat> people will say, well, the barrels are interchangeable. I saw my buddy do it. Yeah, maybe. Generally speaking, it, you don't get the same result out of just taking a set of barrels that was already fitted to one gun and put it on another gun because all of these little different dimensions they, they are different. They are not the same from one gun to the next. Um, the guns that are produced today in the premium lines are more precise than the guns that were produced, say, 10 years ago, because the machines can produce closer tolerances and they have you know, the laser uh, measuring systems and everything that they're able to use to really gauge all of the parts. But the barrels still, still need to be fitted. So at this point, we're going to leave this here. We'll take a break and get to the fore end. So here's our fore end, okay? And we're going to take the fore end iron out of the fore end wood, T15 Torx. Okay, take their two screws that hold it together and then there are bushings underneath there um, that pull the iron down against the wood. You hear that snap? That's good because there's supposed to be a little bit of blue Loctite, not red Loctite, but blue Loctite underneath there to keep these from vibrating loose. And then you can also see in here that Pulled it out there. There's this disc, this bushing, and and there a front one and a rear one, and that's what uh, that's what holds the, the metal into the wood. So here's a four end iron and the two screws. Um, the screws most generally will be the same length. Again, they're T15 Torx, four millimeter by 0.7. Um, if there's if one is longer than the other, the longer one goes towards the barrel muzzle. Okay. So we'll set those aside, and this is here's your fore end iron. Okay, we've got a latch assembly, pretty simple, powered by a flat spring. Okay, these are your fore end levers. The fore end levers they serve to push the cocking rods back, to cock the cocking cams, which retracts the hammers to cock the gun. They also are what times the ejectors, okay? Generally speaking, we don't do any work on these, and, and the work that we do do is a little more involved, and I'm not gonna get into it in this video, okay? So I'm gonna take my forend iron out of the wood, and I'm gonna mount the forend iron on the barrel, okay? And st start to close it just a little bit. Notice that it's not moving at all, okay, because the position of the forend lug at the rear, which controls the tension here, is too far rearward. It's good because Beretta's left us that additional work, wood, metal to, to, to work with in the, in the fitting process. The other thing is, is that it's, it's too tight on the sides of the monoblock. I'm going to work on those surfaces and then come back to it. So I've made some adjustments to get my forend iron to clear a little bit better on the monoblock. Um, then I'll show you where that is in a moment. The next thing is to work on the back of the fore end lug. Okay, and this one right here, if you screw this up, you're in trouble. Okay, you notice that I'm putting a little bit of a radius on the back to ease the edge of that iron down. And the angle on the back side of this, okay, should be 
tipped, the top should be tipped slightly back towards the receiver. Okay, it's not, it's not a 90 degree angle to the axis of the bore. And the reason for that is to take advantage of the fulcrum effect. When the iron closes past its center point, then what happens is, is that the forehand lug is trying to retain the iron rather than push it off under firing. So it's very, very important to maintain the, the angle here. So I'm taking a little bit of that off. Again, this is just one of those things where you gotta sneak up on it. Trash, you can come around the other way now. Now I'm gonna set the iron on and I'm gonna give it a little tap, make sure it's seated, give it a little tap with my dead blow hammer, okay? And then I'm gonna look for the mark that, that I've made there that I can see, you can't see it, but there's a mark. And I'm gonna take a little more material off. Notice that I use a brush to brush the chips. I mean, it was this area, the knuckle right here, is incredibly important and you can't have any chips or debris or anything in there that will that will cause any will cause any galling. Okay, we've got to take a little more. Um, anyone who's watching this, it hasn't <clears throat> changed to a different channel by now, would realize that it takes it takes several hours to fit um, a premium barrel properly. Uh, not always, but in in most cases, to do it properly, it takes some time. The difference between a properly fitted barrel and an improperly fitted barrel on the receiver could could be a hundred thousand rounds of life, you know. So, if you pick up a barrel and, it, and it's not the correct barrel for the gun, and you snap it on and you say, "Wow, that seems like it fits. That's good enough," the chances are you're paying a real price down the road because if the barrel isn't fitted properly and you really wouldn't have any way of knowing without disassembling and putting dye and making some measurements, um, you know, the gun's gonna shoot loose and have problems far sooner than you, than you would hope that it would. So now my, my iron is starting to come, come on there. I'm not gonna put it on all the way. What I'm doing is I'm putting the iron on in order to create a tension or pressure against the knuckle so that I can open and close the barrel with the barrel being forced onto the hinges. And that's gonna give me a much, much truer reading of what's happening on the inside here, okay? So now I'm moving it back and forth, okay? Okay, I'm gonna pop it off, I'm gonna take it apart, and we're gonna look at things. Okay, so what I can see now <clears throat> is I can see <clears throat> in my receiver on the shoulders here, it's pushed most of my die off, okay, which means that we've got contact there already. There's only going to be an increased amount of contact as the gun is used because there's going to be a certain amount of burnishing and setting between the, the hinge recesses and the hinge pins in the receiver and that contact on the recoil shoulders is going to increase. We've got to have a minimum of, of two tenths of a millimeter there. The reason that, that you have to have clearance instead of contact is when the gun fires these recoil shoulders okay, are what absorbs the recoil energy of, of the chamber pressure trying to push the barrels off of the receiver. Okay, so it's, it is a very, very critical part um, in, in, a, in a high quality gun. So now I know I've got to work on these recoil shoulders a little bit. We're gonna get that apart and then come back to it. Okay, this is getting a little bit advanced. I know that this, this video is running on for a long time, um, but the point is, we want to show you how this works. So the recoil shoulders are bearing. We've got to create a clearance, okay? Um, I have a choice to try and scrape the recoil shoulder while it's on the monoblock, which is fairly difficult to do. If it wasn't a replaceable recoil shoulder, that's what I would have to do. These are replaceable recoil shoulders. So you can see there's a screw here, okay? When I've already done this, I've, 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 I've heated that up with a little, with a little uh, butane torch, you know, to, to loosen things up and I put the ejector in to give some support to my next tool. I'm gonna to take this screw out that retains the recoil shoulder. Okay, now I've got it, this chisel and I've just ground it to make it really, really sharp because underneath the edge right there, there's a tiny clearance notch 
and you can see it. You can see it starting to come up. I, I can't get my fingers out of the way, but that kind of comes up. Now the recoil shoulders come out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to relieve this. I'm just going to clean that up a little bit, but I can hold on to the part while I work on it now. Okay, so we're going to take a break and then we'll be back. I've taken that shoulder out and I adjusted it with a, with a Dremel tool and a little bob. Took just, I don't know, probably took two or three thousands off the, the face of it and I've reinstalled it. Okay, and now it's not rubbing hard. Okay, now it's not rubbing hard. The gun is opening and closing nicely. My forend iron is almost all the way on. Okay, I'm going to, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to work on my lug, get the forend iron a little bit further on. We're going to check our bites make a measurement for clearance there, make sure where we're, we're supposed to be, then we'll be back. So we've got those recoil shoulders fitted. We've given them that about a thousandth of an inch of clearance. So I've also worked on the back of the lug a little bit here. So now my forend iron is, is closing on. And what I want to do is I want to get the correct relationship between the iron and the front stop shoulder on the, on, on the barrel. So this, is, this can close just a tiny, tiny bit more, but I'm going to wait for that to, at, to, the, to the end. So basically these barrels, in terms of the barrel being fitted to the receiver and the forend iron, are 90% done. Okay, at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the wood back on the forend, fit that forend so that it goes on and the latch closes properly. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the ejectors in it, we're gonna fit the ejectors. We'll be back. Okay, so we've got, got our forend assembly back together again. Okay, now to control the open and close tension on the gun, I'm gonna take a little bit more material off the back of the lug. Okay, just again, tiny bit now, and then polish the back of the lug with I think what I've got here is like 150 grit emery cloth. So we're just going to get rid of the file marks because that'll make it smoother and just the right way to do things. This barrel will require uh, rejeweling because I had to work on the uh, had to work on the sides of the monoblock in order to get it to, to, to fit in nicely. Putting some oil on the knuckle of the, the, the uh, forehand iron. If you lubricate anything on your gun, that's the most important area. The joint between the knuckle and the knuckle of the forehand iron. That is the most, most important place, okay? So put that on. Now we're gonna try the open and close tension. That's a little bit, still a little bit too tight, okay? I'm gonna take a little bit off, and then at the same time, I'm gonna work on the hook. <clears throat> so that it, she's so that she'll start to uh, start to close for me. You know, this is very very light file strokes are really really sneaking up on it now because if we go too far, what we're doing is we're pre wearing out the joint between the forend lug and the forend iron, and we'll end up with a gun that uh, is too loose to open and close too soon. I'm going to move to the front and take a little material off the underside of the edge of this forend hook. There's an angle here you want to maintain. Uh, I don't know exactly what the angle is, but I've done it so many times I can feel it. Work on that hook a little bit more here. Again, this is one of those situations where you've you got to sneak up on it because if you go too far, it'll rattle up and down. Now, <clears throat> on a sub gauge barrel, the relationship between the forend and the receiver, the angle here is controlled by this, this pad on, on the subgauge barrel. Because what it does is it spaces the forend on its axis correctly with the axis of the, of the bore, which you wouldn't have this pad on a 12 gauge barrel. There we go. We'll reach underneath there with some emery and we'll polish that. 
Now we're still pretty tight, so we're going to take a little bit off the back of that lug. I'm looking to see where it's marking so that I know exactly where to work on. Still a little bit too tight, but we're going to stop there until we fit the ejectors. Now we're going to fit the ejectors. So when we work on the ejectors, we're going to do them one at a time. Okay, on the ejector, there's this, this round knob, we call it a doll's head. That serves to, to work inside the slot in the receiver, basically to cam the ejector into the into the mono block as the gun is closed. And so what we want to do, the first thing we're going to do, I put the lower ejector in, I'm going to mount my receiver onto the barrel, and I'm going to close this. If I met any resistance while I'm doing this, I would stop, I would identify where on that doll's head I'm meeting resistance and I would work on that. It's very, very important, okay, that the position of the doll's head on the, the, the ejector on all model Berettas, okay, is correct so that as the gun is closing, the extractor or ejector, whichever you choose to use for terminology, the extractor is retracted into the receiver at a rate that prevents the lower cartridge from rubbing on the breech face. The, the cartridge should not chafe the breech face when the gun closes, okay? So this is moving very freely, very nicely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put now the upper ejector in and I'm going to, and I'm going to check that. I'm holding my finger on the, on the top lever here to make sure that I have a free swing and that I'm not getting any kind of a false reading. These are both moving very, very nicely and they're moving together. Okay. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is we're going we're to assemble the action the rest of the way back together again, put the trigger assembly in it so that we can dry fire the gun and check the ejector timing because that'll be the next thing we work on. Okay, drop of oil inside each firing pin bore. I'm going to put the lower firing pin in. Notice the firing pin spring has the small end goes rearwards. Okay, small end goes rearwards. Okay, here's the upper firing pin. It's the longer one. Okay, firing pin spring small end goes rearwards. You can see the notches that are clearance for the the, the, the retaining pins. They can only go they can only go one way. You you can't put them together <coughs> backwards. See, I gotta hold my tongue just right to put these together. One of the nice things about the DT is, is that the firing pins are very, very easy to change. All you have to do is take the trigger assembly out and you can get to them. Um, some of the other guns are a bit more challenging than that. <clears throat> okay. I've got to have a slave pin <clears throat> for, the, uh, for the top lever. Uh, this, this whole assembly, that, that when you push the top lever, it, allows you to take the trigger out, okay? So, this is that assembly, okay? I've got a special screwdriver with a notch cut in it so I can get a hold of the leg of that spring and compress it, push my slave pin up across. There's no way I'm gonna get that spring lined up and get this mechanism in without first installing it on a, on a, on a, slave, on a slave pin, okay? So I'm putting that together, aligning these pieces. Okay, now I'm gonna hold my finger on the other side so my slave pin doesn't go down on the floor and I'm going to drive the slave pin out with the retaining pin. Now we're just going to put in the, the spring that applies tension to the uh, trigger retaining block. And there we go. All right. So like I showed you, now we're going to put the trigger assembly in, push the safety all the way forward, open the top lever with one smooth move and then install the trigger assembly. It doesn't make any difference whether the hammers are cocked or decocked. Okay, now that's, that's assembled again. Okay, 
put our gun together. Okay, now, because the hammers are dropped, I don't need to dry fire it. I'm gonna open the gun and check my ejector timing. I'm all the way open, <clears throat> my ejectors have not kicked, okay, which means that they need to be timed. I get a sense of this by holding here, I'm gonna pull the latch, and I'm gonna drop my forend down just a little bit. I had to come down a significant ways, so that means that I've gotta take a fairly substantial amount of material off the underside of the, the uh, ejector hooks. So the ejector hook is right here. And I want you to note that the angle on the end of this hook is not parallel. Can you see that? I don't know if I've got a good background. This angle is not parallel with the body of the ejector. The angle leads ever so slightly so that the forend lever, okay, the, the forend lever when it engages, well, you can't really see it in here. In any case, the top of the forend lever on the back side, okay, retains the underside edge of that hook. And when the gun comes to full opening and the hammers are cocked, this will release the, 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 the ejector and allow it to kick. So, because it's not kicking because it's too long. So, we're gonna use a diamond file and we're gonna work on this hook a little bit. It's gonna take a little bit of material off. And again, I'm going to sneak up on them because if you make it too short and the ejector kicks too early and you're unhappy with that, it costs you a bunch of money. So that was the upper. Now we're working on the lower. That's a diamond file that I'm using. You can't file these with a regular file. You'll watch all your file teeth spark and jump all across your workbench with a horrific sound. Okay, we're gonna dry fire it. Okay, all the way open, still no kicking. Still have a ways to go. Okay, we're gonna work on this and then we'll come back to you. I was just working on those ejectors. I worked on them and now you'll notice we're gonna dry fire the gun, reset the inertia block, fire it again and open it, perfect. I'm gonna adjust a little bit more the open and close tension. I've, I've left it a little bit tight. I wait till the very, very last thing before doing my last little bit of polishing. Um, we're going to put a headspace gauge in and check and make sure that the rim seat depth is, is sufficient, but not over. Um, generally, that's never a problem with, with a Beretta unless you have to take a lot of material off the breech face, which we don't have to do in, in, in these DTs ever. Um, that's very, very closely controlled at the factory, and the Italian proof house checks that and actually documents that. Uh, so this is really the end of it. Um, we've sort of taken you through a little bit about the DT-11, um, you know, what the gun is, what some of the different models are. Um, We've gone through disassembling the, the, the you know the receiver and the, with with particular respect to the locking system. Um, how we go through sort of the systematic evaluation of of where we need to fit on a barrel and then how we actually go about that. Um, this is basically intended to be informational because I've had a lot of people ask me to you know to do this. This is not intended to be in, an instructional video. I don't encourage people to start trying to do this without really some fairly significant uh, training. Um, a, a DT-11 barrel now is about $4,000. Um, if you take too much material off someplace on that barrel, you'll either ruin the barrel or really reduce you know, the, the, the life of the barrel. You also noted that when we did this fitting, we also identified that the firing pins needed to be changed and we cleaned the receiver. So you know, there's some other work that a skilled worker is, is able to do or at least be aware of um, when, uh, when a, a job like this is done in a, in a professional shop. And uh, I know that this has been a very long video for those of you that have taken enough interest to sit through this whole thing. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to watch it because it's taken me some effort to be able to put it together. So.